Good morning. Good morning. Uh, not too many announcements this morning. There is sort of a slight correction to the announcements in the back of the bulletin. Uh, the Abigail group is not collecting coats any longer, but they are collecting uh, items such as, I guess, vitamins and that kind of thing uh, to help with the mission trips that Jamie D takes to Belize. So there's information there about that. But I think the, the coat drive is done for this year. And those were all the announcements I had. Was Hannah, tomorrow night, here at 7. Are there any other announcements? No? We'll begin worship with our prayers. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We have gazed upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth in our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. 
receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have created us to live in love and community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the good Lord formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, the Lord God made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is last this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 8 responsively. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens, out of the mouths of infants and children. You have set up a fortress against your enemies, to silence the foe and avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what are your morals that you should be mindful of them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you have made them little less than divine. With glory and honor, you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4, and chapter 2, 5 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son, whom God appointed heir of all things, through whom God also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact impact, imprint of God's very being and sustains all things by his powerful word. When the Son had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, sub subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, 
should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a husband to write a certificate of dismissal and a divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of the, your hardness of heart, Moses wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, where God has joined, together let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked Jesus again about this matter. He said to them, Whatever man divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the dominion of God belongs. Truly I tell you, Whoever does not receive the dominion of God as a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. This reading from Mark is kind of one of that can be sort of deceptively deceitful and it doesn't really intend to be but I think because it is sort of talking about things that we normally are familiar with divorce marriage children we can sometimes sort of assume that what is being talked about here what Jesus is referring to is kind of is the same as what we would be referring to this, I think, is especially the case when it comes to the idea of marriage. We have grown accustomed to sort of talking about marriage and considering marriage from that point of perspective is, is that we marry sort of out of a sense of love. We've met an individual, we like and enjoy spending time with that individual, and so we decide to sort of get married and to start a family and all of those things. But in the ancient world, marriage worked very much differently. They didn't marry for love. That's not to say that there was, wasn't, love wasn't ever part of, the, of a marriage. I'm sure that many of the people who were married kind of grew to love each other. But that's not where they started. And that was not the primary reason for getting married. In the ancient world, and most of this really kind of comes from sort of the elite social classes, only because they're the ones who wrote things down, 
and we don't really know a whole lot about kind of some of the everyday people. But I suspect that if what is true for kind of the upper echelons of their society also had some truth for those below. And in that ancient world, marriage was really about sort of kind of a promotion. It was about solidifying an alliance, maybe between two great houses, especially if those houses had sort of some political ambition and some political clout. It was about obtaining a certain amount of property. Brides came with dowries. And so in many cases that might be land or extra sort of livestock or whatever, supplies. And it was sort of done in that kind of a way. It was about sort of bringing two families together to sort of strengthen that bond. And by so doing, they would essentially, the, the families would be stronger and be promoted into sort of a higher reach. And so it wasn't really out of this sense of love, that marriage, that people entered into a marriage. They were arranged and they were done so strategically, which is very much different than sort of our modern understanding of marriage. And if marriage was seen differently in the ancient world, then we have to sort of also go with the idea that divorce would have been seen differently in that ancient world as well. And indeed, it was. Because in our modern world, divorce happens. And the prohibition that Jesus sort of gives is not one that is meant to be kind of applied universally. And this, I think, is somewhat the warning or sort of the caution in a reading like this one. Is that just because the Bible says something doesn't mean it should simply be applied to modern day life. But needs to kind of look at sort of the context in which exists. And so when we come to this idea of divorce, our modern understanding of divorce is very much different than it was in the ancient world. Our modern understanding of divorce oftentimes considers sort of the well-being of the people within the marriage. And so when that well-being is sort of put in jeopardy in a whole host of ways, then perhaps divorce becomes sort of the best solution to that particular situation. Because it's promoting sort of the well-being of both individuals, at least at some level. In the ancient world, Divorce was something a little different. First of all, it was only something that the men, the male, could do. Second of all, divorce was oftentimes used in the same way that sort of marriage was used as well. And Mark even gives us an example of exactly this sort of thing happening. The whole issue with King Herod and Herodias and Salami, and why John the Baptist loses his head is because John the Baptist was sort of out in the wilderness speaking against Herod's divorce and then his remarriage to Herodias, who was his brother's wife. It wasn't that Herod sort of had something for his brother's wife, but by marrying his brother's wife, he was able to sort of improve his situation. He was able to become a little bit more powerful of a monarch in that world. And so he cast aside whoever he had been married to and married somebody else to improve his situation. The amount of people that he would have sort of power over. And that is sort of how this idea of divorce in that ancient world really does kind of work. It is something that only men can initiate. And they would do so when it sort of benefited them or their family. And that kind of a situation oftentimes put the woman in that relationship in a very vulnerable and definitely a weak spot. Because a woman in the ancient world were largely dependent for their survival and their well-being on the men in their life. So if her, hus if her husband divorced her and her father was dead or her brothers or she had no brothers or they too were deceased, 
that really put the woman in a very vulnerable spot within that ancient society. She would have had very little method of sort of making ends meet, of sustaining herself and whatever was left of her family after that divorce. And so that divorce in the ancient world did work differently. And when we kind of take that into and put that into context, we see that perhaps it's not sort of the prohibition against divorce for applied universally, but one that does sort of allow for some re-evaluation and some thought. Doesn't necessarily promote divorce, but it also, I don't think, prohibits it and in fact allows us to say that at times that is the best solution possible. But as Jesus is talking about divorce, he also begins to kind of redefine this idea of marriage. And he really sort of redefines it in that ancient context. Because in that ancient world, marriage was all about sort of the male power. And it was the male who had power over the woman. And the Bible itself, Deuteronomy itself, sort of reinforces this. And, we can, and what we would consider horrendous was considered sort of normal in that ancient world. So in Deuteronomy, where it says that if a woman has been raped, the man is then to marry her. That is sort of their solution, their punishment for rape. That I think we would find horrendous, to force a woman who had been raped to marry the man who raped her. But that was how sort of marriage and the world worked in that, in that ancient time. And that is where Jesus begins to sort of redefine how all of that worked. And to do so, he, he sort of ploys an old tactic when it comes to sort of arguing in that ancient world. Because if the scribes and the Pharisees are going to go with Deuteronomy and what Moses said there, and Moses was sort of at that time seen as being the writers of the first five books of the Bible, Jesus would sort of do one better. He would go to the very beginning. And he returns to Genesis. And he quotes from Genesis, and in so doing, he reminds those Pharisees of what God's intent for marriage was from the very beginning. It wasn't so much that it was about sort of a, the male power over the woman, but it was that the two become one flesh. So that becomes sort of a shared power. It is, rather than a power over, it, marriage is meant to be a power that celebrates for the other. And that is about a shared power. It is a power for and with as opposed to a power over. And that same kind of sentiment is also seen in the last paragraph. Where now the situation changes. And we have sort of the little children being brought to the disciples. And here too we have to sort of put this idea of children in context. Because in our modern world, we have sort of very romantic ideas about children. And see, the, see what it means to be a child kind of as maybe a little bit of naivete. Simple, open, honest, all of those kinds of things. And probably many others that I've missed. In the ancient world, children were seen very much differently. It wasn't, they still loved their children. But children were seen as being weak, as vulnerable, and as not having a whole lot of worth. They were not adults. Some of that sort of attitude to children was probably a mere matter of survival. There are estimates out there that say by the age of five, 50% of, or there was a 50% a child mortality rate. Others sort of disagree with that and say the age of 10. Either way, just get into 11, put you, made you, or said that you beat the odds. So there probably was a little bit more detachment just because life demanded it. But at the same time, it is the children are not sort of seen as being kind of these honor, honorable 
sort of individuals, but are seen as sort of an attitude of weakness, of vulnerability, and of not having a whole lot of worth. And it is to them that the kingdom is brought in a unique way, that the dominion of God allows children in. And unless, as Jesus says, we accept it in that way, those would be outside. And so what we see is Jesus sort of re-describing the world around him in terms of sort of God's kingdom. And that re-description turns sort of the power structures of the world upside down. It is a very inverse sort of vision of how the world works. Rather than it being about sort of male power over things, it is now meant to be kind of a shared power, male and female, with and for each other. And rather than sort of entering into sort of the kingdom of God and all of the things that it means to sort of be a man or a woman, it means entering in a way that is much closer to that of a little child with a sense of humility, of weakness. And when those things happen, the world is transformed. It's no longer one sort of just of competition and of me getting everything that I can, even at the expense of others. It changes how we see the world and how the world works. So that becomes a power for others. And we have power with others. A much more inclusive idea of what the world and God's kingdom is meant to be. And it is in those places that Jesus, I think, reminds us it is there where we find life. Life as God intended. And that, I think, is at the very heart of the proclamation that Jesus brings when he talks about the kingdom of God. A kingdom that wants life not just for those who have the power to sort of take it, but wants life for all of God's creation, from the lowliest to the mightiest and everything in between. That is the good news and the power of the kingdom of God. Amen.
Make children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning the call of ministry in all seminarians, that they continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give establish a divine and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve the major land. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you have created. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you. Receive these prayers of God and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. God of abundance, you, you have caused streams to break forth in the desert. And Amen. And manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who art Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as if we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.